So uh, tonight we're in Mark chapter 14. If you guys open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 14, we're going to be looking at the end of chapter 14. So we'll be looking at verses 51 through uh, 72. So it's a big chunk again. However, we're going to kind of go through this in a very, um, you know, brief way just to get into what we want to dis- what we want to talk about. But Mark chapter 14 at verse 51 As Mark continues to write, he says, Now a certain man, a certain young man, followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body, and the young man laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Verse 53, And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests and elders and the scribes. But Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. Now the chief priest and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then or then did, they, uh, test, their, did their testimony agree. And the high priest stood, in, uh, stood up in the midst of and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is, it then men, uh, what is it then these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, what further do we need? Do, um, what further do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be to be deserving of death. Then some began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him and to say to him, "Prophesy!" And the other officers struck him with the palms of their hands. Now, as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And when, he, when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you're saying. And he went out on the porch, and a rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him again and began to say to those who stood by, This is one of them. But he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, Surely you are one of them. For you are a Galilean, and your speech shows it. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. A second time the rooster crowed, then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he had thought about it, he wept. When Joseph and Mary went to Jerusalem on one of the Passovers, uh, they were heading to the Passover, and as they were basically heading back, they usually traveled back in, back in those days, they would travel as a group, relatives and friends, they would all gather together, and they would all travel together. Perhaps it was for more protection, uh, because they had bandits and robbers and whatnot, and a bigger group would be harder to kind of mug and all of that, but they had a big group, so as they were traveling, uh, they, mom and dad figured that Jesus was going to be somewhere in that group, perhaps with their relatives or somebody, but as they realized, as they got there, they realized that Jesus wasn't around at all. And that, that would be like your, your greatest nightmare, right, as a parent, that you thought your, your son or your child was with you, and you realize, where are they? Well, that's what happened to Mary and Joseph. So as they began to kind of look around and realize that, that Jesus was not around, and Jesus was 12 years old at the time. So as they, were, as they were there, they got there, they were searching for him frantically, They were looking around for Jesus, wanting to know, where did Jesus go? Where is he at? Well, they found Jesus, not playing with friends, not skipping rocks by a river. They found him in the midst of these scholars, these religious leaders, who were astonished at the understanding of this 12-year-old. Jesus was asking questions. Now, when his parents found him, when Mary, Mary and Joseph found him, they were a little excited, but at the same time upset. Wouldn't you, if it was a parent? Wouldn't you go to your child and say, where have you been? You know, why did you do this? And that's exactly what they said. Why have you done this to us? And Mary says, you know, 
your father and I have been looking for you. Well, Jesus didn't say, oh, I'm sorry, Mom, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, you know, I just, I just wanted to come here. But instead, Jesus said something very, very profound. He said this, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? What father? Joseph's father? Carpentry? No. He's talking about his heavenly father. Now, when Mary heard this, Mary was stunned at what he said. And the Bible says that Mary did this. It says that she kept all these things in her heart. In other words, she tucked it away. She's like, hmm, there's something interesting about this. Mary probably remembered what the angel said to her back in Luke chapter 1 about how Jesus would actually be a unique child. That Jesus wasn't going to come to this earth to just be your typical person. Uh, in fact, even the angel said that he was going to be the son of the Most High. And he had a specific mission. And the mission that the angel communicated to Mary was that Jesus was going to save his people from what? Their sins. So Mary came to that understanding. And we see that later on in the Gospels, when Jesus was a little older, around 30 or so, he was invited with his disciples to a wedding in, this, in the town of Cana. And Mary was there. So here they are at this wedding. And all of a sudden, they run out of wine. Now, wine is a symbol of joy and whatnot, and, and it was one of those customs during that time that actually enhanced the, the wedding. And, um, it, you know, so they, they, they basically run out of wine. That's like at your wedding, running out of food. Could you imagine that? I mean, you have 200 people that you're going to feed, and you're only feeding 100. How would you feel? And they come and bring that to your attention. You can't feed the rest. You'd probably freak out, right? Well, here's Jesus, or here's Mary. They come to her and says, we run out of wine. What do we do? So she goes to Jesus, and she tells to Jesus, they have no wine. So, so again, Jesus is put in a position now. How is he going to respond to Mary? Well, again, Jesus responds in a very, very interesting way. He says, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? And then he adds, my hour has not yet come. In other words, Mary, I am here, remember, to do my father's business, my father's will. And there is a time when I'm going to manifest myself to the world of who I really am. And Jesus, throughout the Gospels, would con continually say, it is not my time yet. He says, and one of the things that we see that Mary did in responding to her son, she said this, whatever he says to you, do it. I love that. It's pretty straightforward. That's a great answer, right? If somebody's asking you, you know, what does God require of me? Well, whatever he says to you in the word, just do it. Basically, basically that's all you, you know, this is just follow his word. Now, when Mary said that, and like I said before, that Jesus would say several times, my hour has not yet come, my hour has not yet come. He would say that repeatedly throughout the Gospels. Well, in John chapter, or, I'm sorry, in Mark chapter 14, that hour has come. This is the hour that Jesus was referring to. In Mark chapter 14, the hour when the Son of God is about to be betrayed and the hour that he willingly gave up his life for the sins of the world. Listen to what he says in John 10, verses 17 through 19. Therefore, my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. So at this time in Mark chapter 14, Jesus is basically going to lay down his life. He was in control of his life. Nobody took his life. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't that Jesus got caught up with the wrong crowd and they killed him. No, it was that Jesus gave up his life willingly. He had the power, like he said there, to take it up. And we see very clearly that at this time in, John, in Mark chapter 14, Jesus was down to just 11 disciples. One was already gone, Judas. But very soon, he's going to be down to only one, and that's Peter. See, Peter kind of stayed around for a little bit, but from a distance. You're going to see here in a moment. So Mark writes in verse 51, he says, A certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body, and the young man... And then the young men laid hold of him 
and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. What is going on here? Mark is the only one who actually records this in the, all the Gospels. Matthew didn't record this, Luke didn't record this, and John didn't record this. So what is Mark doing? Well, it's interesting because I've, I've looked around as, as far as what are commentaries saying. One, just we just don't know who this young man is. We could only speculate, and I'm going to speculate. Uh, I believe this is Mark himself. I believe that Mark is actually the one who's identifying himself in here. Most commentators believe that it was Mark. Uh, in, in Acts chapter 12, verse 12, we read that Mark was the son of Mary, another Mary, whose house they probably had their last Passover. So we see here that perhaps Jesus, that last Passover that we looked at a few weeks ago, was here at the house. So what happened was this, is when Judas was actually coming back to betray Jesus, Judas actually went to Mark's house, hoping that he would find Jesus there. But Jesus wasn't there. And here's where we meet Mark. Now, some believe that Mark probably took off quickly, either one, because he wanted to go warn Jesus that Judas is here, or he just fled because he got scared. Now, either way, again, we just don't know, but we're only speculating. But Mark inserts this story probably to show everyone that Jesus, everybody forsook Jesus, including himself. So Mark gives us this little verse here in verse 51, but then he goes on into the story in verse 53. Notice what it says, or yeah, verse 53, it says, they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. But Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. So what you're going to see here in the next several verses, you're going to see two things happening. The trial of Jesus. Now, Mark doesn't give us too much information about the trial of Jesus. He's very, very brief. Uh, the other Gospels will give you a lot of the trial. Mark, remember, he's not interested in a lot of this stuff. He's just going to kind of brush right through. So we're going to do the same thing. Now, in this entire trial, you're also going to see Peter. So he's keeping two things going. He's got the trial of Jesus, and he's got Peter, who's actually following Jesus from a distance. So what we see here, we see that he kind of inserts here in verse 54 that Peter followed at a distance. Peter didn't totally forsake Jesus. Understand that. He just kept Jesus at a distance. It was like a safety zone for him. He did not want to associate himself with Jesus. And Mark doesn't tell us, but during that time, the, when Mark was actually walking away from Jesus or from a distance, it was during his trial. It was after Jesus was beaten up and all of that stuff. So Mark doesn't give us too much information on that. But I wonder, as Peter is going through this experience, I wonder if Peter's own words were playing back in his mind when he said to Jesus, if I have to die with you, yet I will not deny you. I wonder if those words were playing back in his mind as this was happening in his life. In fact, Peter even experienced disciples of Jesus actually leaving him, forsaking him. In, in uh, John chapter 6, verse 66 through 68, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with them no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So at this time, Peter did not want to associate with Jesus it was too risky. It was way too risky to say, I'm a follower of Jesus. You know, as I was thinking about this, that's the risk we take uh, as far as being a Christian, isn't it? I mean, when we associate ourselves with Jesus, we're taking a risk. What's the risk? You know, somebody making fun of you, perhaps losing a friendship, sometimes having troubles with your neighbor or, or anything like that. I mean, there's just there's a problem. You know, I was reading a story about a missionary named James Calvert. Uh, he went out to a group of cannibals in the Fiji Islands. And as he was um, driving, as he was in this boat, the, the ship, the captain of the ship turns to him and says to him, you will lose your life and the lives of those with you if you go among such savages. Well, James Calvert looked at him and said this, we died before we came here. It's so true. I mean, that's exactly what Jesus said. When he says, if you want to follow me, he says in Matthew 4, uh, 16, 24, if, you, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Listen, Christianity is not as fun as some see, uh, make it uh, to be in, in America. 
I mean, there's a, there's a Christianity I see in our nation that is this Christianity that has no problems, that, that, you know, your life is just, you know, on clouds. Everything is great. You know, the prosperity theology, you follow Jesus, you'll be rich. You know, you follow Jesus, you'll never hurt. You'll never be sick. I mean, there's this, this, this weird Christianity that we see today that is totally not even close to biblical Christianity. And, and we see here that today it's becoming very difficult and challenging to be a Christian, don't you guys think? It's very challenging today to be a Christian. To tell somebody to say, I'm a Christian. There's a challenge to that. There, 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 sometimes there's difficulties. I see there's a strong resistance to Christianity. And what I see this a lot is among young adults. Young adults who claim to be Christians but have a wrong view of Christianity. What Christianity really looks like. And you see a lot of this stuff, and you see tons of stuff on social media of people, so-called Christians, but when you see their post and what they say, I look at that, I'm thinking, they have a wrong view of Christianity. They don't understand what it really means to be a Christian. They don't understand what it means to truly follow Jesus Christ. There's some kind of confusion in a lot of minds of people today, both young and old. And it's interesting that we see here that even though as we, we, we get to this uh, part of, uh, of, of the Gospel of Mark, as, as Peter is denying Jesus here, we see the same thing happening in our world today. The denial of God's word and the lack of, of, uh, lack of interest to, to think biblically is widespread. I mean, our own Jesus was considered a criminal, was looked at as a criminal. They didn't look at Jesus as a, as a man who came to do good, but as a man who was a criminal. So, so Peter here had a difficult time admitting that he was associated with Jesus. Do you have a hard time associating with Jesus at work? Do you have a, a hard time associating with Jesus when you're around family members who you know are not Christians? If you have a hard time associating with Jesus, if you don't want to, tell, you don't want to show people that you're a Christian, then, then there's a problem. But, but that problem can be fixed tonight as we get closer to the end. You know, when I got saved, we see here as Peter is denying Jesus, actually, let me just uh, say, make this mention here in verse 54, that Peter actually sat. In other words, he was trying to mingle with them. It was a way to hide his faith in Christ. And, and, and what we see here is that Peter feared man more than God. He feared man more than God. And when I first got right with God, when I got saved, when I was born again, I remember that I, I feared man more than God. Because the things that I did when I got saved, I, didn't ha I did not have a radical transformation. Mine was a very slow progress. It was just slow. It was just one of those things that it wasn't like this change overnight. But we know, but I know that when I was got when I got right with the Lord, I, I was still hanging out with my old friends. That never really changed in my life. At least the first year of me being a Christian, I, I didn't give up my old friends. Now I'm not saying to give up your old friends. If you're if you're impacting them, if you're influencing them, that's a good thing. But for me, I wasn't even doing any of that stuff. I was just kind of still mingling with them. I was still hanging out with them, drinking with them. I was still going to clubs. I was still just, you know, partying with them. It was just one of those things that I kept my faith in Christ hidden. I did not want to show it because I knew that I'd be a hypocrite. But if you were to ask me, do I believe in God? Are you a Christian? I would tell you, yes, I am. See, my life was more of, 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 of as a practical atheist. And there are a lot of people in our world today that are practical atheists. And what, what does that mean? It means that a person that says they believe in God, but the way they act and live is as they weren't accountable to God. And that's exactly the way I was. The first year, I was a practical atheist. And there's a lot of practical atheists today that will tell you, I believe in God, but the way that you see them living their life is as they weren't accountable to God, as if they had no belief in God. Well, we see that Peter was actually kind of living that life in some way. And we see here that he was warming himself at the fire. Notice that it was their fire he was warming up to. Peter's fire for Jesus was quickly burning out, and the fire of unbelievers began to warm him up. That was his problem. It reminds me of Lot and his family when they moved to the city, Sodom and Gomorrah. The city was full of sin. It was, it was a horrible city. And when Lot was told to leave that city, his wife had a hard time leaving it. And in fact, I remember when it says there that she actually turned back. When God says, don't have her turn back, she did. She looked back, and she turned into a pillar of salt, but she was missing it. She was missing that lifestyle. Well, Mark will come back here to Peter and end with his denial, but let's go into the trial here, verse 55 to 62. I'm just going to kind of go over this real quickly. 
55 to 62, we see Jesus is put on trial. Now, here's what Mark doesn't cover. Jesus went through a total of six trials. And I'm going to give you these six. One, the very first trial he went to, uh, through was with the high priest. He was brought to the high priest first. The second was the Sanhedrin. That was an illegal trial because it was a trial at night. And they weren't supposed to try people at nighttime. So right there was illegal. That's how desperate they were. Then after the Sanhedrin, then the second time was, uh, the third time was with the Sanhedrin again, but in the daytime, the right trial, the official one. Then after the Sanhedrin, then they send him over to Pilate. And then when Pilate brought, it, brought him up, he realized that he was an innocent man. He sent him to Herod. And when he was made fun of before them, they send him right back to Pilate. And then unfortunately from Pilate, he was executed. Six trials. The Sanhedrin were the Jewish Supreme Court made up of 71, including the high priest. He was kind of like the president. And it was an informal trial, uh, to put, uh, which uh, it was uh, an, against uh, Jewish law to put someone on trial at night, as I mentioned. But they were so focused on putting Jesus to death that they wanted to get a head start, even if it was illegal. From verses 56 to 59, they couldn't find any evidence to put Jesus to death. So they'd start making up words. Notice what, what it says there in 56. It says, For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. There were some, uh, that then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build, it an, I will build uh, another made with hands. But not even then did they, their testimony agree. So we see here very clearly, they couldn't find any evidence to put him to death. So what they did is they start adding words to Jesus' mouth. Temple made with hands. He never said that. This is what Jesus said. John 2, 19. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. Now, did you see the difference there? They added to the words of Jesus. They took him out of context. They knew that the destruction of a worship place was a capital offense. So what we see here is the devil at work once again. The devil is at work once again, and the devil is the biggest heretic in this world. Amen? He's the biggest heretic in this world. Remember what, Jesus, what he said to Eve way back in the garden. He said, did God really say that? No, 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 God didn't say you would die. He says that you'll be like God. You'll be Mormons. Because that's what they believe. They believe that when you die, you become a god and you populate your own planet with spirit children. That's Mormon theology. But we see here very clearly that Satan is a heretic. And anytime somebody begins to add to God's word or twist God's word, it is satanic in nature. It's satanic in nature. Listen to what Paul said to the Galatians in Galatians 1.8. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. So it's a big offense. It's huge. God does not like this. So these religious leaders are adding to Jesus' words. So they had two questions for Jesus. Notice in verse 60. They said, when the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, do you answer nothing? What is it? These men testify against you. He kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked them, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? When he says, Do you answer nothing, literally in the Greek, it means, it says this, You are going to answer your accusers, aren't you? That's what he's actually saying. Explain yourself. Defend yourself, Jesus. This is your opportunity. Well, what we see here. And, and we see that these men are testifying against Jesus. We see that these charges are basically not really helping out at all. They're not working. And what we see here is that Jesus remains silent, and this frustrated them even more. This was all part of the prophecy, a prophecy that was given to us in Isaiah. Listen to what it says, Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Part of a prophecy. So they're asking Jesus, 
point blank. Are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? Well, Jesus says, I am. Powerful statement that had deity written all over it. Jesus right there is claiming to be God. If we go back into the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, when, when God appeared to Moses, and when God sent Moses to Pharaoh, this is what God said to Pharaoh. He says, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel that I am has sent you. I am, just that, that, that phrase or that title speaks of his relationship with his people and he becomes the great I am to his people. The becoming one is what it means. He becomes their all in all. And that is why Jesus was going to be stoned to death when he said in John chapter 8, verse 58, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And they picked up rocks, remember? See, people will say, skeptics will say, well, where in the Bible does it say that Jesus claimed to be God? Right there. You can mark that down. John 8, 58. Jesus is the great I am. All that we need is in Christ. He's our provider. And it's interesting that we see here that this illustrates in the Gospels, uh, in the Gospel of John, it illustrates this entire phrase. Because in the Gospel of John, there are seven I am statements. And I'll kind of go through these real quickly with you, real, just to show you. We see that Jesus claimed in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Then he says in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Then he says in John 10, 7, I am the the door. Then he says in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And lastly, John 15, 1, I am the true vine. Now, what do those mean? Well, when Jesus says, I'm the bread of life, he's talking about the main source of spiritual nourishment. You get that from Jesus. He will nourish you spiritually. When he says that I am the light of the world, he's talking about our main Ill illuminator of spiritual truth. If you want to know truth, read the word. He will illuminate his truth to you. He's the light. When he says I'm the door, he's talking about the main entrance to the kingdom of God. When he says I am the good shepherd, he's talking about he is our main leader. When he says I am the resurrection, he says that I am your main hope for eternal life. When he says that I am the way, the truth, and the life, again, he's talking about our, our main road to the Father is only through Jesus Christ. And lastly, when he says I am the vine, the true vine, he says that I am your main source of spiritual fruits. Powerful statements. Jesus Christ is the great I am. He supplies us with everything we need. Everything we need. No wonder David said this in Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Are you in need tonight? Jesus will provide that. He is your all in all. He's the one that pro will provide everything that you need to godliness, spiritual fruit, spiritual nourishment, strength. So we see here that this is the first time in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus openly declares, yes, I'm the Messiah. Pretty powerful. But then he adds to this. Notice what he says in verse 62. He says, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Ooh, he adds a little power there. Uh, what he's saying here is that he's how, he has the same authority that the Father has. And he's referring to the day when he will judge these earthly judge, judges. It's like, you guys are putting me on trial. Guess what? There's a day coming that I'm going to put you guys on trial as the great judge. John 5, 22, 26, and 27 Jesus says, for the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son. For as the father has life in himself, so has the son, so has granted the son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. So these guys are the ones who are on trial. It's not Jesus. So when Jesus returns to this earth, he's not coming here to save people. He's coming here to judge it. You know, when he comes back on earth, He's not going to come here riding on a lowly donkey. He's coming on a white horse. Totally different. 
So right now, it's a period of grace. Right now, the world needs to get saved. They need to get right with God because right now, he is the Savior. But after the do God closes these doors of salvation, and, and what I mean by that is once the great tribulation begins, God now begins to relate to this world as judge. They could still get saved, but they're going to have to go literally through hell to get saved. But when he comes back and steps foot on this earth once again, he's not coming as this Savior, but as the judge. It's over. And we're going to be with him, too, in Revelation 19. We're going to be on horses, too. So we see here very clearly that the high priest here is actually being, he, Jesus is really speaking truth to this man. But in verses 63 to 65, we see here that that really did it for the high priest. He tore his clothes because he knew Jesus has just claimed to be God in front of him. So here's where they start abusing Jesus physically. Notice what happens. Then some began to spit on him, blindfold him, and to beat him, and to say to him, prophesy. And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. Spitting on somebody, especially on someone's face, was an actual act of total denial and insult. They were, dis they were just insulting Jesus. Here is a sinless man who came to do good, who came here to basically remove people from bondage, to make people better, not worse, and yet they're beating him up. Weird, isn't it? It's like you or I, did, let's just say somebody helps you for something, and they were very nice for helping you out. Let's say you had a flat tire. Let's say that you didn't have a tire, and they happen to have the same tire that your car has, and they just throw it on there for you for free, and they did all the work for you. You know that you're like, man, what a nice person, but instead you beat them up. You just start beating them up, spitting on them, kicking them. You're like, you're mean. He, they just helped you. It's exactly what they did to Jesus. He came here to help a sinful world that needed him. And all they did was just smack him, spit on him, pulled his beard, and put a crown of thorns upon his head. And the world continues to beat Jesus up. It's like the world sees Jesus as this person that is really bad and is only doing harm to people's lives, and he's not. So we see here that they're doing this to Jesus, and they're saying, prophesy who hit you. Jesus kept silent, even though he had the power to tell them to stop and to blow them away right there. But again, because of the scriptures, all this was being fulfilled. 1 Peter 2.23 says this, who when he was reviled did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. You know, it's interesting because we, what we see here is that as we know that Jesus did not retaliate, obviously he's going to be retaliating at the end of the age. But we're, we're also told not to retaliate. We're also told not to, hey, you know what, sometimes there are times that we just need to let God step in and help us out and, and to be our, our, our defender, our fighter. Uh, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay, the Bible says. You know, when Moses killed that Egyptian, he didn't have, God did not, he didn't need any help. He didn't need help to wipe out the Egyptians, you know, he Buried him under the sand. You know that didn't work. And, and he was trying to fight for God. And God doesn't need your help to fight. Now, of course, you know, there's some situations that we have to stand up for our faith. Like even today with our pastor, he was talking about, you know, what was going on with the school district and all of that. You know, those are times that we step up prayerfully, stand up and say, no, this is, this is what we need to have in the city and whatnot. And God steps in and he does a lot more beyond that. But there are times that we have to take steps back and just say, you know what, I'm not going to start anything here. I'll just let the Lord deal with it. You know, today I was getting water, and um, we, we, we drink, you know, purified water and all that stuff. So, you know, they have those dispensers out in stores and all that. Well, as I approach this, uh, these two dispensers at the store uh, with my little four-year-old, almost four-year-old, um, there was a guy there that was actually taking both of them because he was filling up the five-gallon jugs, and I had just one-gallon jugs. And, he, and I'm thinking in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, he's going to remove one and let me take the other one. But he didn't. He got the other one and put it back in. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I want to say something. I, I, I want to say something. I want to say to him, you know what? Give me a chance here, man. You know? It's like my unchristian, right? My unchristian attitude wanted to say, listen, get the thing out. I, I want to share, man. Sharing is caring, right? Like my little girl says. And I, and I was literally wrestling with the Holy Spirit inside because the Holy Spirit was really reminding me that I'm a Christian, not a fighter. 
Because the Bible even says that I'm not supposed to be a brawler, a quarreler. But I was so close to saying something to him to say, I don't like what you're doing. And it's great that the Lord will remind you, hey, that is not your position anymore. You're not there anymore. All right? You're a Christian. Pray for him. Be nice. When he finished, he took his thing out, and he was very kind and nice. Now you can use it. I'm like, duh, you're done, you know? <laughs> I wanted to use it a minute, 20 minutes ago. But you see, these things happen, and it goes through your mind, and you're like, you just want to say something. You, want, you know what, Lord, I'll step in. I'll do this, you know? Let me take care of it. Sometimes the Lord reminds us, you know what, just, just don't even worry about it. Just let it go, man. As we tell our kids or, or people, adults, pick your battles, right? Well, we see here that Jesus could have wiped these guys out. Remember when Peter was going after the head of that one uh, soldier? And Jesus said, Peter, I don't need your help. And you know, I can call a legion of angels to come here and literally smash these guys in front of us. But I'm not going to do that. The same thing here. Listen, you guys are going to be beating me up. You're going to be totally abusing me physically. But listen, I'm going to be your judge at the end. You're going to see me again. And you're going to be begging for mercy when it's too late. And we see here, this is exactly what Jesus is saying. It's like, listen, I'm not going to retaliate. But it was all prophetic. So what happens now? Well, Peter, or John, or Mark goes back to Peter. Now notice what happens. Verse 66, now as Peter was below the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also were with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I, ne I neither know nor understand what you are saying. And he went out on the porch, and the rooster crowed. And the servant, of, uh, the servant girl uh, saw him again and began to say to those who stood by, this is one of them. But he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, Surely you are, the, you are one of them, for you are a Galilean, and your speech shows it. Then he began to curse and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. A second time the rooster crowed. Then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And when he thought about it, he wept. Peter looks and speech, his looks and speech gives it away. He was a Galilean, and Galileans had an accent. So they were picking up on it. Well, you are one of the followers of Jesus. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. I have no idea what you're talking about. And notice what he says. He began to curse. Now, this doesn't mean that he began to use profanity, like when we think about cursing and swearing. What it means is that Peter put himself under an oath to God. It's like equivalent to ours when we say, I swear to God that I'm telling you the truth. Why do people say that, right? And when you see that in court and you put the Bible, or your hand on the Bible, I swear to God to tell the truth and nothing but the truth and whatnot. I mean, they're putting themselves under an oath. That's exactly what Peter said. I swear to God that I'm telling you the truth. I don't know this man. That's what he's saying. But notice, though, it says that Peter remembered. It's like the Spirit reminded him of what Jesus said. I'm sure that Peter remembers the words of Jesus because even in Luke 22, 61, we're given a little bit more information on what happened during that time. It says that the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered. See, what, 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 what sparked that reminder was Jesus catching eyes with Peter. And, and, and listen, and it wasn't, I, I doubt that it was a, a stare, like a stink eye, like, you, I told you. I believe it was a, 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 a look that was a look of a broken heart, like, I told you, and I knew you were going to do it. When Peter caught eyes with Jesus, it broke him. He collapsed. He couldn't do it anymore. And it says that he wept. He was so convicted. Have you ever been so convicted in your life as a Christian that you sometimes almost want to cry? Lord, I can't believe I just said that. I can't believe I did that. God, please forgive me. I'm, I'm a jerk. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Peter just broke down emotionally. He wept. He bitterly wept. He was overwhelmed with his denial that he broke down and cried. You see, we see here that 
Peter and Judas both denied Jesus in one way or another. Peter and Judas both had some interesting experiences with Jesus. I mean, Judas was called the son of perdition. And, and he was called the son of destruction. He didn't get right with God at all. Judas was totally out in left field, spiritually speaking. He felt sorry for what he did to Jesus, but he never repented. He ended up hanging himself. He committed suicide. The conviction was so big, so strong, that instead of going to Jesus saying, God, forgive me, he just killed himself. He couldn't take it anymore. Judas was like an apostate. An apostate is someone who says they know God, but in reality, they have never made that connection with Jesus as Christ and Lord. They're still lost. Peter, on the other hand, models for us the life of a backslider. Peter did not deny Jesus 100%. He just kept him at a distance. What, what happened to Peter is what happens to some people today in, within, Christian, within the Christian realm is that Peter suffered a spiritual decline from an experience he once enjoyed. That's the life of a backslider. See, a backslider had a strong relationship with Jesus at one time, but they went on a spiritual decline, and they ended up basically denying Christ. Proverbs chapter 14, verses 14 says, the backslider in heart will be filled with his own way. And that's exactly what happens. They're caught up with themselves. Peter was following at a distance. That was his own way of following God. It was all about him. You see, backsliders don't totally reject Jesus. You can still have a conversation with a backslider about Jesus. And they'll still say, yes, I understand what you're saying. I know. But a backslider tends to walk on the fence. They tend to walk on the fence with having one foot in the world and with God. They try to compromise and they try to live both worlds. I want to end with this. I'm going to give you guys four simple characteristics of a backslider. But what do you look for in a backslider? Now, when I give these kinds of messages, people kind of like sit up like, okay, here we go. Woo! All right. Let's see. I've read my Bible today. I prayed. I'm at church. But listen, it's not for you to be freaking out. But perhaps there are some in here, I don't know, that are here struggling. Sign number one. They're distant walkers. They're distant walkers. They walk at a distance in heart. They keep Jesus far away. They aren't, they aren't close to him anymore. As Peter walked from a distance, Jesus basically did not, or Peter did not want to associate himself with Jesus. Jesus said that men profess me with their lips, but their hearts are far away. They're a million miles away. They're distant walkers. They're distant from Bible reading. They're distant from praying, distant from fellowshipping. Now, let me add this. These signs are basically for those who are backsliding and doing this habitually. This is not one-time thing or you missed to read your Bible yesterday. You're like, I'm a backslider. No, it's not about that. You know, I miss church. I'm, I'm done, you know. No, this is a habitual lifestyle. This is something that's happening on a regular basis. That's what this is. This is somebody who's regularly walking at a distance with Jesus. This is, this is their lifestyle. They're creating this as a lifestyle. So if this is not you, don't worry about it. Right? You're, you're good. But we see here very clearly that a backslider or backsliding is not just falling backward. It is also failing to go forward spiritually. They don't grow anymore. They're, they're stuck. Listen, we are either progressing in our walk with Jesus or, we're, or we are regressing. You know where you're at. Are you progressing or are you regressing? The second sign that we see, a characteristic in a backslider, is that they are people without impact. They are people without impact. They have no impact on the world. They're just like flatlined spiritually. There's no, no, no impact to those that they're around. They get very comfortable with sinful behaviors. They don't think of them anymore like, being bad or whatnot. They act like the world. That's what they do. Jesus taught that Christians would be recognizable by their distinctive behavior. There's something different about you. It's what sets you apart from everybody else. You don't have to be a John the Baptist. You don't have to be a Billy Graham or a Greg Laurie. 
But there's got to be something in your life that says, mm, you are a Christian. There's no way. You are a Christian. There's something that, that, that shows that you are connected to Christ. Peter sat. He got comfortable with the people, and he began to warm himself up with their fire. He had no impact at all. So, not only are they distant walkers, not only are they people without impact, but they are people that lack bravery. They lack bravery. Peter said, I neither know nor understand what you're saying. Backsliders are ashamed to let non-Christians know that they are believers. There's no bravery in them. They're not brave anymore. They're not bold to say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Now they're like, uh, no, I'm not. Well, no, I'm not really. They deny Jesus. And usually they deny Jesus with their non-Christian friends, but they will honor Jesus around Christian friends. Because, And I'm speaking from experience. I deny Jesus around my non-Christian friends, but when I was around the church, I was high-fiving you saying, amen, God bless you, love that message. <laughs> it only happened when I was with my non-Christian friends. You know, I, I think I mentioned this a while ago that I had a nicthus on my truck years ago. This is not years ago, but this is like way back when I got saved. I got saved when I was in my early 20s. And, you know, I remember just... When I got saved, I got, there was a little spark in me. I'm like, yes, I know Jesus, but then it just kind of faded away. And then the remnants were left behind. A nick was on my truck. And I remember I used to stand behind it to cover it when I was around my friends hanging out drinking and talking smack. You know what I mean? Because I felt really ashamed of Jesus. Don't see the ichthus. Don't ask me what that fish meant. Well, they lack bravery. A backslider lacks bravery. And lastly, a backslider is a compromiser. They're a compromiser. They will try to have, like I said, one foot in the world and one foot with God. Peter had his eyes on Jesus, but he also had his eyes on the world. And you really can't do that. You can't have one eye here and one eye there. Physically, you can. <laughs> Remember that this all started with Peter walking at a distance. So, if you feel that you are living your life at a distance, then you're on, on the verge of backsliding. If your heart is distant from the Lord, then you are getting, you're heading that, in that direction. You need to get back on track. Well, how do you do that, Robert? Well, Revelation chapter 2, verse 5 says, Jesus said to the church in Ephesus, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. There's always time to repent. There's always time to, to go back to where you started, to get back into that relationship you once had with Jesus. God always has that door open for us. Jesus is always waiting and willing to restore you, and to bring you back. And that's exactly what he did to Peter. He didn't leave Peter backslidden. Remember in the last chapter of John, Jesus went out and he actually restored Peter. Peter was much wiser, but we know that Jesus actually restored Peter. It was God who said to Jeremiah, Return, faithless people, I will cure you of backsliding. To his own people, the children of Israel. The process of backsliding is a gradual one. It's a slow fade. A slow fade. It's not something that just happens overnight. You don't just go to bed tonight and you wake up, I'm backslidden, what happened? No. It's a, it's a slow fade. It's, it's a slow fade. It just doesn't happen overnight. Why not make a fresh commitment today, if you're here tonight, to make a fresh commitment today to move forward in your relationship with Jesus? And just get yourself back on track with him.